D. Rowe, I yeah. remember uh, at the start of, of this season, there were two guys that were really struggling for this Atlanta Braves offense. That one was Marcelo Zuna. People were ready to DFA him. Mm. And then Michael Harris the second. He comes off of his rookie of the year campaign and really struggled to get out of the gates, but he's he's found it right now. Yeah, I had a chance to call a couple uh, Braves games with Bob Costas and getting a chance to sit down with Brian Snicker. It's funny. He had a couple injuries we're going to talk about early in this tape at the beginning of the season, and it's almost like that those first three weeks of the big league season, everyone's feeling themselves out. Well, Michael Harris didn't have a chance to do that. So when he showed up, the train was already moving. And he really struggled the first couple of games to get it rolling. But what an embarrassment of riches this Braves lineup has. I'm going to bring up a couple of boards. This guy's hitting ninth in their order most days. I mean, when Albies went down, Snip moved him into the two-hole nickel and dime there. But for the better part of the season, he's hit at the bottom of the order. So let's dive in. And he is one of the best players in the game, batting ninth on a nightly basis for the Atlanta Braves. And I don't know if he gets lost down there, but when his numbers show up and his totality of his game and his tool set, he's on par with two guys Fernando Tatis Jr. of San Diego Padres, who we think is one of the best players in the game, and J-Rod in Seattle, again, one of the best players in the game. And that's what Michael Harris paused this. Bring up the first board. Players to rank in the 85th percentile in expected batting average, outs above average arm strength, sprint speed, basically all tools up. You got three guys. You got Michael Harris the second, you got Julio Rodriguez. The way we talk about these two guys is not the way we talk about him on a nightly basis. We put a Cunha in that, in that three, three headed monster right there. And it's Michael Harris. So I want to dive in because at the beginning of the season, let's go. He's made some subtle changes. April, he gets nicked up stealing second. Then, if he's not in perfect shape, the way his knee goes right there, that could have been season ending for him. I remember being in Montreal with Brian Jordan of the Atlanta Braves doing something very similar. And be because he was so strong and so jacked in his lower half, he was able to protect the knee and not be out the entire season. Has he made subtle differences? Kevin Seitz are one of the best hitting coaches in the game. Run this. I think he's made a little bit of difference. Hands are pretty much in his paws. The leg kick's a little bit different. Oh. Much higher early in the season, kind of reaching back. He's made a subtle adjustment to kind of hang that leg a little bit lower. Kind of see the ball a little bit deeper. Run it. And it's helped with rhythm and timing for him because he's driving the ball to all parts. And this is not the first time he's made adjustments. Pause this. Last year when he arrived on the scene, he was a high hands guy and he was getting beat a little bit. Seems to be an MO with Kevin Seitzer in the Atlanta Braves. You see him in August of last year. The hands got lower. Ronald Acuna's down there. Matt Olson's down there. And it's working for him. And he could spray the ball all over the lot. Let's dive in. Bring up his season splits for me. So first 38 games, you're coming off injury. The offense is rolling. You feel like you're not a, uh, not a part of it. Your body's not in shape yet. You throw out a 163 with a 244 slug and a 35 weighted runs created plus after signing a $72 million deal. Five years, you got the sunglasses that everybody's wearing, the money mics, my kids got them. In the last 83 games, he's gotten back to normal. 347, a 570 slug, and a 151 weighted runs created plus. So what is he able to do with the plate? Rhythm and timing, let's run it. He handles everything. He's got massive opposite field power. That ball is six inches off the outer half in Milwaukee, and he shoots a double down the line. Yesterday, a hanging slider in the middle of the plate. That's 420 dead center off the ferns in Citizen Bank Park. So he's able to move the ball all over the lot, and he's able to handle extreme velocity. 98 miles an hour, Miguel Castro, nice. opposite field gap. Left on left, Alvarado, 99 in. I'm not cheating, I'll shoot it the other way. Bring up the 97 mile per hour board. I thought this was interesting. Guys who end up on here. Highest average versus 97 plus in the game this year. Alex Verdugo's hit 400. Randall Grichik's been on waivers 16 times this year. 
He refuses to blink. Still raking, 389 versus high velocity. Luis Robert and on down the line and Michael Harris. What else you got to do to be a great hitter in this game? Let's get back into it. If you're a left-handed hitter, you better be able to handle left-handed pitching. Ooh. Hanging breaking ball from Patrick Sandoval. These are bombs. He makes the game look real easy. Mm. He has got a rhythm to the way he plays. The game's very slow to Money Mike. He does a lot of things real easy out there. So he impacts the game in such a variety of ways. He allows Snit to move Ronald Acuna over to right and protect him a little bit from himself. And his career splits versus left-handed pitching. Last 83 games, he's hitting 350 with three bombs and an on-base of 357 and a 536 slug. So doing everything for a team that's got a guy who's going to win the MVP, potentially go 40-40, a guy who's going to hit set the Braves' single-season record for homers in Matt Olson. And, oh, by the way, when you get down to the nine slot in the order, you're staring this guy down.